Haunted places have long been a staple in Stephen King's writing. That's because the locations that inspired his writing have dark histories themselves. I remember the first Stephen King book I read. It was Christine. What I wanted was some good scares. What I got was so much more, an overall sense of dread. That feeling of dread weaves through all of Stephen King's works. I kept having to remind myself, it's just a book. It's just a book. But is it? Imagine a place where horror lives, where people live their lives under a dark and mysterious cloud. A sleepy small town, an all-American main street. In King's world, these become the places that haunt you. I'm Dave Holmes, and I'm gonna guide us as we explore the real places from King's life that influenced his most famous fictional town, Castle Rock. The idea that the landscape we live in is somehow malevolent is a very, very scary concept. Castle Rock, Stephen King had it in Cujo, The Dead Zone, several other stories, The Body, Needful Things. It is the most written about towns of all of his books. And Hulu's new original series takes us deep inside the seemingly cursed town of Castle Rock. Castle Rock, the series, is a, a bit like reading Stephen King's epic novels. It lets us take this world that he's created and tell a brand new story, but not limiting ourselves to any one aspect. What brings you home? Got a call from Shawshank. I found a kid in a cage. It's hard to beat Shawshank as a location and as a story. While the story of Hulu's Castle Rock begins at Shawshank Prison, it continues by exploring the rest of the town's dark history. You get back there much? No. I guess everyone thinks they grew up in the worst place on earth, huh? When we started this project, the last time that Stephen had actually written about Castle Rock was in 1991 or 1992. We felt like we needed to really cover where would it be now. Through decades of writing about Castle Rock, Stephen King has left clues about where the town may be or may once have been. If you follow those clues, you may end up in Maine, right in King's own backyard. Stephen King spent his childhood in Durham, Maine. His early stories were set here because it was so familiar. He'd walked every road. He knew every corner. And that quickly drew him in to the darker things that can happen in this town. always looking for like past remnants of things. There's a lot of little hidden gems in the woods. Tia Howe lives in Durham and is a lifelong fan of Stephen King. She's a member of the Durham Historical Society. At one point, everything sort of died here. The shops closed. When the railroad came in town, nothing came to Durham anymore. There was a lot of quietness and it really never picked up again, which kind of gave it an eerie ghost town feel. Because it's so quiet, it gave him that ability to tune into that dark side. This town, I don't necessarily know if it made him that way, but I think it helped him be that way. Every little story he writes has something to do with something that happened to him. Stephen and one of his friends actually witnessed a man's body being pulled from Runaround Pond. It sort of incorporates the story of the body. It's really fun and it's almost like a puzzle to try to figure out where he got that inspiration from, like the hill from Pet Cemetery or the Marsden House, which inspired Salem's Lot. I feel like the most eerie place in Durham would be Brickyard Hill Road. There's many abandoned junkyard buildings. 
There's an old cemetery. It's been rumored that the girl Carrie from the book Carrie lived on that road. I think he wants us to know what it was like for him growing up because it was important to him at that time. King left the Durham area after graduating high school. He went to college up near Bangor, which is the area he still calls home. And it might be the place that brought him the most inspiration. Steve's always maintained that to be successful as a writer, you have to read all the time and you have to write what you know. And that's why so much of his stuff is set in the Bangor area. A lot of authors bring their hometowns to their work, but few have done so as vividly as King. He paints such a clear picture that to fans of the novel It, the town of Derry is easily recognizable as the real town of Bangor, a town Stu Tinker knows well. The beginning of It starts with the little boy Georgie put the boat down in the gutter in front of his house and eventually it went down a drain. And uh, when he looked in the drain to see where the boat went, Pennywise was in there. In reality, Steve was walking one morning and there was water running into this drain at the end of the street. Something as simple as water going into a drain came out as this fantastic, almost 1,200 page book. For nearly 30 years, Stu Tinker and his wife Penny ran a popular bookstore which specialized in Stephen King's books. Since selling the store in 2009, Stu now puts his knowledge to work, giving tours to King fans of his beloved hometown of Bangor. So along on the left-hand side is, is what's referred to as the Barrens. The Barrens is where the kids in it always played. The Morlock, the opening into the sewer system, was located there. Plays a major role in, in the whole book. Steve's got a tremendous imagination, and I think everybody has those little fears, whether it's at, in your hometown or somewhere else. It isn't a true reflection of the town, which is good, because <laughs> I wouldn't want to live here if it was. <laughs> We're turning into Mount Hope Cemetery. This plays quite a, a part in the book Pet Cemetery. And for Steve, it was a place to go when he was in college. It was quiet. Got some character names for his early stories off of headstones. There's one we found a week or so ago. We were kind of uh, showing people where he had stood. And there's a carry on it. And I think that's just the way Steve did it. He just walked through and he'd see something and the name stuck with him. They don't usually object. My experience, the dead are not particular. So coming up on the left, uh, this was Stephen King's inspiration for Randall Flagg. There's a store here in the outskirts of Bangor called RM Flagg and Company. He took the initials of RM Flag and made it Randall Flag and has used him basically ever since as his bad guy. He said he had always thought the devil was just a metaphor, but now he knew the devil was a boy. He can take any appearance he wants and he travels as a crow. Uh, so. We have crows all around, uh, as you can hear. <laughs> uh, no, I didn't plan that. <laughs> this was uh, built as the Bangor Insane Asylum. This 19th century psychiatric hospital was the inspiration for Juniper Hill, an asylum that's appeared in King's scariest works. Right now, only about 20% is used. The rest of it is, is just empty. Every time I look at that building, I, I just get that terrible feeling. You know, if there's gonna be a haunted building in, in Bangor, it's gonna be there. Stephen King didn't just use his own observations in town to create his stories. King would also draw upon the legends of Native American curses and the power those curses can have on a place. 
It was very turbulent here in the early years. There was sort of a honeymoon period with the Native Americans, but at the same time, everything was being taken away from the Indians. Leslie Rounds is the executive director of the Saco Museum. She's closely studied the history behind one of New England's oldest and most famous curses. In the summer of 1675, three sailors supposedly rowed up the Saco River. And when they got up near here, where Saco is now, they encountered a young Native American woman who was paddling across the river in a canoe. And she had in the canoe with her her baby boy. And they had heard that Native American children were born able to swim. So they thought that it would be a good idea to tip the mother and the baby into the river and see if the baby could swim. Well, he couldn't swim, he sunk. Unfortunately for the white people, she was the wife of Squando, who was the sachem of the Secogus tribe. And he, so the story goes, then cursed the white people and said that from that day forward, three white people would die in the river every year until they finally left the shores of the river back to the Indians. People here that live along the river seem to believe that there is this curse. And when someone drowns in the river, which happens practically every summer, uh, then the curse is often cited. The idea that the river is cursed, it's such a dark idea. When you look at the river and you think that we, we all have to live with this river all the time and that it might come and basically pull you in, that's so horrifying. It's not just legendary curses that have influenced Stephen King's works. Some of his writing's scariest moments were inspired by real life horrors. Coming up here on the left, this is the canal that Steve wrote about at the beginning of it, uh, where Adrian was thrown into the water. And uh, Pennywise came from under the bridge and dragged him off and killed him. In real life, uh, when Steve was actually writing the story, uh, we had a young fellow named uh, Charlie Howard get thrown in here. And unfortunately, he drowned in 10 inches of water. It, it actually made the determination for Steve to change the story from being based in Bangor to being the fictitious town of Derry. Uh, he was just afraid it was going to uh, offend people and, and bring up really bad memories of, of what had happened. It did make Bangor sound kind of evil. There are dark parts to a town, of any town, I guess, if, if you live in it long enough. Some of the people that I've met here that have come into the shop, they are, they're disturbed. After years spent building his personal collection, Gerald Winters moved to Maine and opened a rare bookshop filled with Stephen King collectibles and memorabilia. His writing does bring out the dark in people. The books affect them in a far deeper way than they would me, and that's, it can be scary. I have the, um, the ax from Stanley Kubrick's version of The Shining, and I don't have it behind glass case. I don't have a little plaque attached to it, I, because the fans that come in that know the movie, they know what they're holding is one of the axes that Jack swang in the movie, but it is a weapon. The darkness Stephen King creates can have a powerful effect on his fans. Late one night, Gerald met a disturbed King fan who seemed overcome by this darkness. He hadn't looked like he had bathed in weeks. He saw the axe, and then he picked it up, and then he said, I'm going to release these demons. I'm going to release them for you. So he just held the axe over his head, and at that point I knew that he's either going to hit me or some or hurt himself. So I, I have a panic button to the police, and within a minute, the local officer came into the shop and no questions needed to be asked. He just took them away and I never saw him again. We've seen how locations can influence unsettling events throughout the different places in Stephen King's universe. But perhaps the most unsettling place of all is Shawshank Prison. The real Shawshank, the former Maine State Prison, was so horrifying that in 2002, the state tore it down. 
With the prison story, Shawshank King really nailed it, I think. Peggy McRae is an historian who studied the terrifying past of the main state prison. He kind of freaks me out. <laughs> it's just too intense for me. And it was real life. It's a place that celebrated barbaric punishments and stayed open despite fires which burned prisoners alive in their cells. The first warden, Daniel Rose, was very much a disciplinarian and believed in penitence, feeling sorrowful for your crimes so that you would not repeat it. I picture him as kind of self-assured Therefore, he did pretty much what he wanted. State prisons should be constructed that even their aspect might be terrific and appear like what they should be, dark and comfortless abodes of guilt and wretchedness. And that kind of sums up what Dr. Rose was pretty much in favor of. So this is a model of the original prison, built in 1824 and designed by Dr. Daniel Rose himself. The original prison were actual dungeons in the ground. There was a pit, actually. A hole in the ground. Well, their hope was that it would make them want to get out of there. <laughs> make them do their time and never come back. What do you think it does to a guy? What? Being here, trapped, alone. They were big on solitary confinement, and it gave them time to turn to their Bible, to repent. It was just very, very harsh for what they had done. It was more his way of dealing with it. It was almost like raising a child. I wouldn't want to be his family. <laughs> but... People died from murder. People died from suicide. People died in the fires. If a ghost wanted to roam the halls of somewhere, I would say that would be a very, very comfortable place for a ghost. The ghost of past horrors may inhabit many places within Castle Rock. And since place is so important in King's universe, the creators decided to film where they thought a real life Castle Rock would be today. We wanted to find a town that felt like it was sort of Castle Rock after the storm. We did this sort of pilgrim's journey, traveling around through New England, and spent a lot of time in tiny towns in Maine, trying to get a feel for um, what Castle Rock might look like now. Okay, here we go, and action! I think there can be a tendency in representing the small towns of the Stephen King library on screen to sort of cleave to this sort of Norman Rockwell quaint idea of Maine. And the reality of Castle Rock is much, much, much weirder than that, that has a whole lot of scars to show for all the disasters of the past novels. So it was really, really important that we find a place to shoot that would kind of capture the soul of that place and also a sense of why people have stayed. And to recreate Castle Rock on screen, the trademarks of Stephen King's universe also had to be brought to life. Every place that we kind of inhabit has an echo in some way with the larger Stephen King universe. A serial strangler died in my house, and I sleep like a baby. There are sort of a few different levels of the Easter eggs. We believe that in some way, the entire thing is kind of a Stephen King Easter egg. I had the pleasure of working on Carrie. And so I thought, how many opportunities will I have to do something so twisted <laughs> again? There's some dogs that play a very significant role in season one. Cujo is sort of a part of that lineage. Every time we have engaged with sort of a reference or a place or a thing that, that has appeared in one of the books, we have always really tried to do it in the service of the story that we were telling in this, in this season. We came to the materials fans 
and the young readers of Stephen King that we were would never have imagined that we would get the keys to the city and be able to try to imagine what life would look like in Castle Rock in 2018. Castle Rock is more than just a physical place we can now see and experience. It's a culmination of all the places and memories from Stephen King's life. Stephen King creates a whole universe of, of books that are centered around a trinity of made-up towns, but he writes about them so well that every time you hear about a new book coming out, it feels like you're going home again. We certainly hope that across the breadth of the series, we're gonna to get to touch on a lot of different corners of the King universe. We hope that it, it'll be an exciting entree to Stephen King for people who may not have ever read a Stephen King novel and that there will also be some finds that will reward the kind of OCD level completist. What drew us to the material was this feeling that it was a town that's almost like a sort of advent calendar of horrors, where if you open any door or window, there's a story behind it. Done well, horror turns off the rational mind and it puts you into a situation that is as terrifying as you could possibly imagine and, and usually beyond. And Stephen King, the magician that he is, creates these worlds, these stories, and knows how to make you believe. Welcome to Castle Rock, premiering July 25th, only on Hulu.